This is video two in fulfilling my obligation to share some of the things that I've received about um, spiritual preparation. Uh, in this video, this discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about signs of the times. But I have a different approach than some people to the signs. Um, I really think it's important to make it remain something spiritual and not become academic or become an exercise in speculation. You know, there's always some guessing, but it can it can take us over easily, I think, just like a lot of things can that we maybe overdo or we just miss the mark. So when I talk about this, um, there's a couple things I want to begin with. And one is that um, that we have a promise that we will recognize the signs of the times if we are filled with light, right? And so to the children of light who are not of the night nor of darkness, as Paul expressed it, that day will not overtake them as a thief. They will recognize the signs as certainly as a woman in travail foreknows the approximate time of her child's birth. So when you think about that, you think about the um, a, a woman in um, travail of labor, right? And you even think about it in, in the more in the broader context of pregnancy. Uh, you've got nine months of pregnancy, right? Um, labor is the very end of those nine months, and then of that, uh, you have maybe a a twelve to sixteen hour average. I know this can vary a lot. I just looked up averages um, window of of labor, and um, that's pretty narrow it, compared to the overall pregnancy to that overall period of time. Um, there is a sense that uh, a woman has of when that hour is is close. Um, similarly, the uh, so so we we know that um, with that analogy that we can see or recognize that hour um, pretty closely. The other analogy that's given in the scriptures is the fig tree. When one saw the leaves of the fig tree, he would know that summer was near. So it will be with the elect who are watching for Christ's return to earth. They will know that it is near even at the door by the signs that are given. And so, you know, um, Elder McConkie went on to say, for our present purposes, it suffices to know the children of light shall know not the day or the hour, but the approximate time of the Lord's return. This approximate time can certainly be narrowed down to a generation. That's that's a, a lot of interesting things in there, right? So you see now the addition of the word, the elect, will recognize. Again, the reference to children of light, those who have light in them. And so we can see that the emphasis and the responsibility that we have to be to become the elect through our actions and through our devotion to our Heavenly Father and to um, to be filled with light. And that's a whole multiple uh, discussions on that that, that uh, I think that I'm supposed to do here and we'll focus on those later on. But those are kind of prerequisites to being able to recognize. But the other thing that I think is important is to recognize that that's a promise. There's multiple places in Scripture and in prophetic statements that we have an actual promise that we can know the approximate time of the Savior's return. And and I, um, I'm i not really interested in really detailed attempts at timelines, and this is not going to be that. You're going to see some dates, but it's because what I asked about um, had to do with the beginning of the calamities, and it had to do with, with purposes of preparation and warning others and, and delivering others and helping them to be um, ready. So the focus is on on the why and it's on um, preparation and it's not on just a, a timeline just for a timeline but it's important to, as you begin this if you have that that you feel that desire to understand the times the seasons and the proximity that faith is always a key component you you have a promise that we can recognize that so as we seek to become filled with light be purified and be one with the savior receive the mark um, or the sign on our forehead which we'll talk about a little bit more in this we we need to then exert faith in in our prayers and make this a matter of prayer and not like I said just a matter of academic speculation to help us understand 
what is ahead um, help, to help us be prepared as we prepare tempor temporally, but also spiritually, and to help us know how to warn. And, um, you know, everything that, that we're given, everything that I'm given, I'm, I'm not told to, to share, but a lot of things we are. And the, the most basic warning is just about becoming uh, one with the Savior, right? And hearing him. That's the warning we've been given very directly by uh, the prophets. But um, but it's important to remember that, that it should be a matter of prayer and it needs faith. We need to actually call upon those promises that we, we can know that approximate time of his return. And, and with that, we can know when the calamities are the all-consuming, as, as uh, President Hinckley and then Elder Maxwell importantly described, calamities are, are upon us. And then we need to make sure that we're asking for the right reason. Um, you know, it's stated to not, not to consume upon our lusts, but to, to uh, truly serve him, to be able to recognize so that we can be prepared, we can prepare our families, we can help others prepare. And that's, that's been my goal, um, certainly imperfect in it, but that's been what I've tried to do and how I've asked. And, and so what I'm going to share with you today is, is some of what um, I recently received about the eclipses. And this one is interesting because, you know, I, I've, for months and months, I've, I've asked to be able to recognize the signs of the times and to be able to um, see, and I felt prompted to be able to, to, to see when all consuming calamities are upon us, where, there, where things fall apart, like sometimes how we express it, uh, things really get bad, so that I can help people prepare. And I've had callings um, that, uh, that make that important because I've, they've been associated with emergency preparedness at the board level and then at the stake level. Um, and uh, they've really helped us know how to prepare and, uh, and be timely in it. But all that time asking, you know, I, I received promptings and, and uh, indications and a feeling like, for example, that when China invades Taiwan, you know, really watch out. Um, but just little things here and there, and then also things about what to prepare for, you know, looking at, thinking about um, where I live, where, where we're located here, uh, about an earthquake, you know, potentially about an EMP and different things there as we seek to understand and we seek to be filled with the spirit of prophecy, which is something that's really misunderstood, right? We, we worry about that because we know that, you know, what happened when... In Third Nephi, before the Savior came, we know that um, that, as it says, prophets came to the land. Many, many prophets came to the land and warned people. The same thing happened in Jacob. You'll see when uh, the people were separated and they were about to fall into uh, a pretty bad state, and um, and you'll see that many were inspired to to prepare to to preach and to warn. And this is a, it, it, you can see just numbers, a lot, a lot of people. And so I mentioned that just because um, we are encouraged to pray for the best gifts and to seek the best gifts. And one of those may be to seek the spirit of prophecy. And of course, that spirit of prophecy can help us within our sphere of responsibility. The things that are ahead of us, the things that are ahead for us. Um, it, it does not mean that we are... Uh, prophets for the church in terms of the keys uh, that uh, are, are carried there. But we live far beneath our privileges. And we, as it comes to the gifts, as it relates to the gifts of the Spirit, we do not seek the best gifts. Um, that, at least that's, in, in my life, I know that that's been something that I've not done until recently and prayed to to know what gifts to to ask for and, um, and then to... Uh, to act in faith and to seek to develop those. So um, anyway, that, that bit of a backdrop there on the spirit in which we should come at this, both in terms of faith and in terms of focus. And, um, and it's important as you go along, I think, at least in my mind, in my heart, to keep this about something that is spiritual, to keep it centered on correct principles, to not have it overcome us. The, the, the most important thing the greatest focus 
should be on spiritual preparation in terms of personal purity, being pure in heart. Anyway, I just want to make sure it's clear because um, I see so many videos on on timelines and a lot of them are really, really good and there's a lot of good people. And I'm not trying to suggest that that coming at this academically is is, is a sin, um, but we're, we're more likely to be deceived uh, and and uh, we have a promise that we can know spiritually. And so, you know, you combine both of those, and uh, to me, it, it makes it, one, important that it's not the entirety of our focus, but two, that it is approached spiritually. You know, there were, there were Elias's that come before the the Savior's first coming, um, you know, we all, we all know about John the Baptist who prepared the way, but there were many more. You, you can see them on both continents. And uh, of course, the Lord is going to want us to be aware and to warn our neighbor. Uh, just so many scriptures that, that describe that. We hardly talk about the second coming, even though the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve have in over 40 talks since 2000, which is a huge uptick from before that, that period of time, have talked, not just mentioned the word second coming, but have talked about specific ways to prepare for the second coming and called upon us to prepare for the second coming. But as a people, we don't. We're afraid of disappointment, I think. Um, we're afraid of being deceived. And so we, you know, we go to one end of the spectrum or the other. And, and it just, it's such an important thing to be, to be balanced and focused on this. Um, in, uh, in the last five years, there have been almost 20 talks so half of those that occurred from 2020 to 2023 uh, here um, have been in the last five or six years. Uh, definitely the prophets are, are telling us to focus on it, um, telling us to, to the, the, of the reality, the proximity, uh, but it's important to do it the right way. Okay, so um, what I feel to share with you today is something that I recently received, and it was a huge blessing for me. And so with that, statement that I made or statements that I made about seeing this the right way. Um, I, I'm not trying to convince anyone of a, a timeline. I'm sharing with you um, something that I know I received by revelation for myself. And, um, and, it's, and it's sacred to me. And I'm not going to share everything that I received, but I'm going to share what I'm supposed to. And, and as I do that, I, I'll reflect that same principle that the most important part of this is not what you're going to see in dates. The most important part of this is the symbolism of the sign that is made by the eclipses. So we're going to talk about the eclipses that are coming ahead here, and um, and and what they mean spiritually, what what the symbolism is, and where that comes from in Hebrew, and, and what that means for us as it relates to spiritual preparation. So um, a lot of the revelation I receive happens when I'm when I'm helping someone else. It can be in temporal things, it can be in spiritual things. But when we're about doing his work, it's amazing how the, the, the veil seems to melt away and how the heavens open. And this was no exception. I was helping, I was talking to someone about preparation, both temporal and spiritual, uh, a colleague of mine in a rare window I don't usually get. And, um, and somehow the eclipses came up and he asked me some questions and I had pulled up a a depiction, a map, this this map here, uh, or similar to it, that I have of the the eclipses that happen, the, the total eclipses that happen over North America, over the United States specifically. And he saw this word Tav written on it there. And he said, what does that mean? And I shared with him a couple things that I knew about it being, meaning um, the end. But it it made me realize that that was something I intended to, to look at more. And so I shared a couple of things with him, pulled up a couple of things while he was there. And, and that began this stream, this download that happened over the next um, maybe hour and a half, um, two hours, somewhere in there, where one thing after another just, just came to me and sources just were appearing in ways that I love to research. And this part of the miracle is that I know how research works. And, um, and this would have taken me weeks and weeks and weeks on my own. And I still wouldn't have found some of these, these horses, these locations were really, really obscure. And so it was a miracle for me because 
you know, just because of things, you know, my background as an attorney, um, it, it came so, we say unnaturally, but spiritually, um, it, everything was quickened. The time, the, uh, the, my ability to, to grab it, the, the way that, um, the order of things fell into place. So I'll never be able to capture fully what this means to me, but I can tell you, and I'll say this probably again, that I know that I received this from him. Um, and so as I go through some of this and I share some of the things that I interpret, you know, there may be things that, that I'm still, and I'll, and I'll try to kind of separate the things that I think are outflows of things and the things that I know um, I was given. And so I know that they have the significance. So, so as we look at this map, you'll see that over a period of seven years, 2017 and 2024, there is a an X formed over the United States. Okay, that there's that that pattern, and um, it's a seven year period, which is significant. You think about preparation. You think about um, uh, you think about Egypt. There's a lot of things that you can you can think about time of preparation that was given. Um, seven years of preparation and fatness, and seven years of leanness and and uh, um, judgment and drought. But now look, a half of a, of that period of time, three and a half years passes, and then that same sign is made over the Middle East. Now, the chances of these two patterns being formed, and that's that pattern again happens over a period of seven years. Okay, 2027, the first, 2034, the second. Um, the, the chances of these two patterns being formed, the chances of the intervals, um, you know, there have been a dozen, maybe up to 15 solar, total solar eclipses over North America in the last 150 years. Um, so they're, it's not like they never happen, but the pattern, the timing, and how close together they are, um, it it is absolutely intended. We know that the Heavenly Father does not do anything, our Savior does not do anything, but what is intended. There's no signs in the heavens that are accidental. And so looking at, you know, trying to understand them uh, becomes important. These ones, they form the sign of Tav. And that I had seen, that part I had seen, and I know a lot of people had seen that. That sign is a Hebrew um, letter. It's the last letter of the alphabet. And it oftentimes is represented on its side like this, um, and, and not straight up. You can see it sometimes as a cross, right? The cross was actually representing it, but um, it, it oftentimes is depicted just like this. What that sign means is important. So f first we know, as I mentioned, that Tav is the last letter of the alphabet. It means the last, it means the end. But one of the first things that was shown to me was an excerpt from the Talmud um, about that sign. And, and um, in a very obscure place, but in the Talmud, the sign of Tav is the end of the seal of the Holy One. Okay, it means the end of the seal of the Holy One, which is Christ. Okay, that's, there's a lot there, and I'm not going to go too far into what that means, but just think about the seals and think about the end and think about what that represents in and of itself. The Tav also means a mark. Okay, and so when you think about this end, um, that's one layer to, to recognize. Um, you think about the seventh seal and you think about seals generally. But then continue from there and look at the Old Testament all over the place. The, the Tav or the, the Ta, which is the same, um, different word, same uh, character, means a mark. So you'll see that in the Old Testament, you'll see this described as a mark, as a, even like a signature. It's interesting that we, how, how can we, if we don't write out our name, we can um, give a legal signature with an X. Think about the origins of that, that it's a signature or a mark. So David made marks on the doors of the gate and the word ta, tav, is used there for that mark. Um, it was intended to ward off danger, provide protection. Now those are important, those marks, to ward off danger and provide protection. Job makes a passionate plea for hearing for the Almighty. He says, here is my signature, here is my mark, 
here's my ta, hear me, because he has that mark. He's um, he's showing that, and uh, that word again is used um, when you go back and look at uh, at Hebrew or you look at um, Greek, you'll see that um, it means associated with the mark. It means a seal. Okay, and Ezekiel nine four is a very important passage on this on this topic generally and on this part of what tav means in ezekiel 9 4 there's is a vision um of that of what tav plays as a passover role similar to blood on the lintel on the doorposts of the hebrew home in egypt in ezekiel's vision the lord has his angels separate the demographic wheat from the chaff by going through jerusalem the capital city of ancient israel and inscribing a mark a tab upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all of the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Okay, so this is a mark of those who are Christ's. It is a seal on the forehead of those who are Christ's who see the abominations that are happening. And it is referring to um, our time, our moment, as much as it was a time before. And the Lord counts the tav-marked Israelites as worthwhile to spare and counts those people worthy of, in, in this quote, annihilation, who lack the tav and the critical attitude that, it's, that it uh, signifies. Okay, and so the tav was a sign that of loyalty to the Lord. It was a sign of those who did not become part of Babylon, um, were dismayed and disheartened and... Um, had no allegiance to Babylon. They sighed and cried at the abominations. You know, think of the things we see around us, you know, just most recently, perhaps, you know, child trafficking. You know, what's our attitude um, towards the evils of the day, the Sodom and Gomorrah uh, reflections we have? Are we, are we supporting them? Um, are we, um, are we supporting causes or are we uh, showing allegiance to anything that's contrary to God's laws? Or are we becoming one, loving individuals, um, but loving our Heavenly Father above all, loving our Savior Jesus Christ and showing allegiance to Him? That is, you know, the beginning of this. And of course, the seal, there's a lot more to that. And we may talk a little bit more about it today, depending on what the Spirit dictates. But certainly later on, uh, it, it indicates the tab sign. When that sign is made, the second cross of the uh, eclipse is made, it represents the um uh, the, the seal in the forehead okay it also represents for those who have not taken upon them the name of christ uh, in their forehead the it represents judgment it represents separation okay so <clears throat> if we continue on in their in ezekiel in verse six well, verse 5, to the others, so those that did not have the, the mark of those who sigh and cry for all the abominations, um, he said of my hearing, go after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Slay utterly. I'm not going to say all that stuff, but bad stuff. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. Okay, we've seen other things about this in Isaiah and other places that these judgments begin at his sanctuary. So you can also see in this, um, in these verses, that what's happening here is both protection as well as judgment for those who have not received the seal in their forehead. Um, in addition to that, it's, it's a, it represents separation. So we know President Nelson has said the time is coming where the righteous will be separated from the wicked. That's a literal separation. And, you know, we can talk about how that can easily happen. All it takes is the power going out, frankly, and uh, the Internet going away. But, um, but that separation is spiritual and it's also literal. And the sign of the tab indicates a time of separation between wheat and tares. We know that until the end, they grow together and then there's that separation that occurs, and it doesn't have to occur in a moment, but there's a period of separation. So these are important things to, th to think about, and, and, I, and I am confident that the Lord intended these things. So, you know, some of the things I'll, I'll share 
I, I don't have that, but for me, and you know, you have to approach uh, the, uh, the Lord yourself and ask about this and get confirmation because it should not be, oh, that's convincing, therefore I believe it. This should be approached like any other gospel thing. Um, protection and then judgment and separation. Those are all things that are intended by this. Note also the path of the eclipse, the path of the eclipses. You'll see the, the sacred sites that they pass right over, um, Adam and Diamond, Camorra, and Kirtland. These, these um, important locations that um, there's definitely, definitely intentionality with that. Also, look at the facsimile. Um, when you look at facsimile number two, you'll see right there in the center, the, the sign of Tav is made in the mountains. Um, and, uh, there's different things that that represents and, and a friend of mine, Drake knows, uh, this and a lot of the interpretations across the facsimile far better than I do, but, uh, it's the navel it represents. Um, it also represents that sanctuary. Okay. So the sanctuary is first, the tab there is first, and, um, it's first made there and then it's made in Jerusalem or over that area. The first is last and the last is first. Judgment comes, as you see in Ezekiel first, uh, to to uh, those who receive the gospel, the Gentiles, last. The last becomes the first, the first becomes the last, and then it goes to the, uh, the, the old world there, and it goes to the Middle East. And then judgment and a fullness of the all-consuming calamities, I think, occurs there next. So those who have not yoked themselves to the Savior um, are subject to the judgment of what that sign represents when it's completed. We had seven years of preparation as the sign be was, was, uh, had begun to be made, and then we have that period of, of judgment. Okay. Now I feel to go to Revelation, Okay, the book of Revelation, and we're supposed to understand the book of Revelation. We've been told... To seek to understand it and um, when you look at the book of Revelation first in Revelation 7 2 I saw another angel ascending to the from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels these are the destroying angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads Okay, now refer back to Ezekiel 9. It, this is that period of time. We're in this period of time where the, the seal is to be received in the forehead. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, now this, at this point, it's important to go back now and look at the fullness of the eclipses in over the United States and this, this side of the world. Now, when you look at what's about to happen in October... And when you add that, now it's not a, a total eclipse, and I think that that's significant. That is a partial eclipse, 90% eclipse. It doesn't apply to everyone, um, is, is what I think the symbol becomes. But what it does is an unmistakable sign. It forms the sign of the Aleph. Okay, so you see this pattern, this A pattern here. It looks like an A. This is the first letter, perfectly, is the perf first letter of the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet, the, the sign of the Aleph. Okay, the first now we have here, this, this eclipse then becomes, this formation of eclipses over the United States becomes the first and the last. The first and the sign of the Aleph, the significance of that is, is also very important. Aleph means oneness with God. Okay, that's what that means. It means oneness with with God, it, it, it um, signifies the period of time before that sign of judgment is made in which the sons and daughters of God have, I think, I feel, an opportunity, a window, a responsibility to overcome, to make that sign, to receive the mark in the forehead. It is a time, you know, not just this time, but I think in part, specifically what President Nelson was referring to when he was mapping really the book of Revelation 
and, and saying that between now and the time he returns in power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. That has to do with overcoming. It has to do with election. It has to do with the fullness of the priesthood in us individually. And eventually even, um, it has to do with translation. And that seems silly to some people, or it seems out there, but um, the reality is, and that doesn't mean necessarily translation in that moment at the time of that sign, but that's what overcoming leads to for some who are to be in the millennial, um, the millennial, the first millennial generation. We know it's very clear in scriptures that the, the uh, eventually um, the peoples in the millennium are all a translated people because they're living in a terrestrial sphere and a, t their, a telestial uh, body would not be able to withstand that, that sphere. And so translation is real, but it refers to um, oneness with our ancestors and temple work and being saviors on Mount Zion, um, overcoming the weakness within our generational lines. Think of how loud or how clear the, um, the prophet has been and the prophets have been about how important it is right now to be in the temple more than we ever have. Focus on the temple more than you ever have. There the Lord will teach you directly. There he will teach you how to rend the veil of unbelief. I mean, there's so much more in what he's saying than a lot of people realize. It is so important. Associated with this, this sign, this, um, this time for us to be in the temple. He changes us there. There are changes that happen spiritually and even physically. Um, if you can work in the temple, I highly recommend it. So you think of, and if you can't, it's interesting how many people have been prompted to attend. You know, he said more than ever, uh, focus on it like you never have before. Um, we always, there's never been a, a, a frequency stated, right? And a lot of times in the past, people have felt like, and it's been kind of widely accepted that, uh, a month, going once a month was something that a lot of people did and felt that was good. It's interesting how many people without being told an interval have felt prompted to go weekly. Now, I know a lot of people who go weekly and everyone lives in a different circumstance and different distance. And so your interval reflects obviously the access to the temple and your own circumstances. But, but I, whatever it was, focus on it more, try to be there more and then try to pay attention there more and, and focus on, you know, asking him, as President Nelson said, tell him you're serious about overcoming and ask him what to do and then follow the promptings. And he will, he will give you those promptings in that um, October 2022 talk, Overcoming the World. So this window, I feel um, between now and April, and especially between October and April, is a critical window of overcoming, being receiving that seal. And I'm not gonna go into depth of what that seal means, I think that the most important thing to start with there is that in addition to more, it means becoming pure of heart. It means that when he shall appear, you shall be like him, becoming like the Savior, becoming as a little child, um, being yoked with him, being able to tell him honestly, thy will be done, um, our, our Heavenly Father, telling him that, that we trust him enough to say thy will be done and that um, we... Uh, we can say that we will, that he would prevail in our lives, that we put our, our will on the altar. And that's, you know, we'll talk more about that other, other discussions, but that's so important. That's the, that's where you start. And he will reveal things as you seek to understand that more and more, um, about the temple and about, uh, signs and even, you know, tokens and things that, uh, can't really discuss here, but that's the LF. It's so clear. You see it right over the United States. You see um, the, the perfection of the symbol. You see that it doesn't apply to all. And we, where there's no Aleph, there is only Tav. And and Tav is that period of judgment. The, the, the mark over the door before it's too late. And April represents Tav. It, it does. And October represents the Aleph. Also, the... Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew of the Hebrew word emet, okay, which means truth. Um, and this is an important word because you know we know he's the truth and the light. And um, and Tav actually signifies truth, but that word truth is made up of the first, the middle, and the last letters of the Hebrew language, or um, of the Hebrew alphabet. So the aleph, the mem, and the tav. 
Okay, so when you look at truth, you have the Aleph, the Mem, and the Tav all together. That word in Jewish belief, that word Emmet, was car carved into the head of the golem, which gave it life. Okay, so you have this life when that word is together. But when the letter Aleph was erased from the golem's forehead, what was left was was met, which means dead. So when you take away a left, you mean you receive, you have dead, you have died. And that attaches itself to judgment, right? So without the left, there is judgment. Without the left, there is death. And uh, that's an important symbol in uh, these signs. Now, when you put these two together, the left and the tav, you get the first and the last, right? And so we know that Christ refers to himself as the first and the last. In fact, in Revelations 22, he refers to himself as the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last. And thereby, he was telling us directly that the Hebrew alphabet uh, provides revelation about him. There's a key when you combine those, those and the surrounding verses. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. And I give unto every man as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they who do his commandments, and that they may have right to the tree of life, that they may enter into the gates of the city. Okay, so the Aleph and the Tav are used over 5,000 times in the Old Testament, him showing as a secret way he would show. And you notice that the Aleph and the Tav are all over the first and the last, but yet they didn't recognize the Christ when he came. The Jews didn't. But he was saying in a secret way, I've, I've seen writings um, about this, scholarly writings about this, but that it was kind of meant to be something that wasn't um, as obvious as just coming out because he was going to try his people. But it was a secret way to show himself, his identity, and above all meanings, Aleph and Tav signify Christ. So they are a, a, a signal, a, a symbol and a, a representation of him. Of course, at the same time, Satan is working over time, consistently, constantly, to mark his own. He has his counterfeit of everything. You know, you see, we know about the millennium. You hear about this new world order things, right? We know about um, a rainbow with seven colors. We see a rainbow with six. Isn't that interesting that the original rainbow um, flag that represents pride had six colors in it? Six is an important number. Seven is an important number. Seven is the true order of the rainbow. Um, but anyway, there's a counterfeit. It'll never quite hit it right, right? Um, these phones we talked about, they can become a counterfeit of Urim and Thummim. Uh, but he has a counterfeit for everything. And he is sealing his, just as the Savior is sealing his. He's sealing his own. We know about the mark of the beast. So I'm not going to get into that. And, and I would encourage you to not just think of some one thing. Uh, whenever we are um, putting forth a symbol that represents Babylon, we are supporting him and we are showing a sign that um, that we are his, we are Babylon's, even when we don't intend it. Sometimes we might think we're, we're loving someone by doing that, but the reality is that um, we, we lose the ability to have a fullness of love when we do anything to support something that uh, is contrary to God's laws because we cannot have the divine love that is charity. And that's clear in Moroni 7, um, 48, that charity is a divine gift. And without it, we're just left with natural affection. And affection will never touch what we need to have for these, our children, our loved ones. We have to have charity. And so we have to be yoked with the Savior to help them be prepared, to help our, ourselves be prepared so that we can help them and help others around us. So back to Revelation 13, 5. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and caused that many, as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and rich, or great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay, here's this perfect example of him imitating and sealing his own before that judgment begins, before the, the, the uh, all-consuming calamities begin, that no man might buy or sell, save he have that mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. The number is an important thing too. So those who have not overcome are overcome themselves, as Revelation describes. And after the sign of Tab, the angels are loose to cause a fullness of destruction that uh, torments those who have not been sealed. So that takes us to 
Revelation 9, 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. Now you see the, re the reflection here, the similarity between Ezekiel 9. This is it now, directly, specifically, and only speaking of the last days. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death, shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Okay, so a terrible period of time. I do think, this is a side note here, or maybe just a little increment, that in as much as the sign of the tab means means judgment and means death, there is this period of time of torment, but not maybe complete um, death or certainly not a, a, a burning of the fields, right, of the vineyard, uh, this period of torment. And I have long felt, and I think I'm going to probably do something specific to this um, separately, but there is this window of time that President Hinckley talked about and President, um, Pre and, uh, President Eyring, then Elder Eyring, talked about that they described as the second great harvest. And you think of this window of time where everyone is being humbled because they're seeing what's happening. And it's it's clear that what is described there, and maybe I'll put a link to it, um, even though it's going to happen later for, for those who see this later, to that discussion about the second great harvest. But I know there's going to be this window of time uh, because of the clarity of their words and because I feel it, that people are compelled to be humble. It's better to be humbled now and it's better to be prepared now. And we probably, those who do, many of which, if not all, uh, may have less to go through. Um, even if it's the same trials, your perspective will be completely different. You'll see the second coming instead of the end of the world. Uh, you'll see hope instead of, um, instead of having your hearts fail, our hearts fail. But that, that um, period of time is an important period of conversion. So that what it references is five months, and I don't know if that means exactly that, but uh, if it does, a period of time to um, to go and hunt, to go and fish the the, the uh, people out of Babylon that will be humbled and will turn the right direction, will tip in instead of tipping out. And even with the sign of the Aleph in October, there's a very real chance that, and I know that there's some um, who have done a lot of good work on this, uh, that there there could be um, a period of incremental tribulation that um, that happens to help people to this mercy, right? To 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 take the Aleph, right? To take advantage of the Aleph. This period uh, before the fully all-consuming calamities are upon us. There may be increasing calamity that helps some people wake up. There may be interesting things said in the October conference. Um, that is greater clarity that helps people wake up. There may be some mercy associated with October and associated with that sign to help the saints, to help the um, uh, the, the sons and daughters of God uh, all over to to wake up to what's happening. I don't know that. This is that area where I said it could mean this, um, you know, that I don't know for certain. I do know the things that they represent. Um, for me, I have a certainty of what those things represent. Uh, what what signs are being made, the intentionality of the signs. You can even look at the the other partial eclipse that happens. Look at how perfectly it starts just outside of the United States. Uh, the, the Lord, I think, is is not wanting to dirty the uh, the uh, the the tapestry of what He's forming here in these signs, and He's showing that that, that one is not. Uh, d does not have the significance, at least for the United States. Maybe in the lands north it does, but but uh, he's he's showing really that this sign, he's showing it as clearly as as uh, can be, and uh, he's helping us recognize it. So to wrap up here, because the sun is getting high, summer is high, right? Fig tree. Um, more than anything, like I said, I my my purpose intent here is not to convince you of anything factually um, but to have you consider and to pass on because I'm supposed to a portion of what I received as it relates to the signs and as it relates to what some of that means I don't I'm not a Hebrew scholar I'm not a, an astrologist um, these things were given to me and as a, a mercy and in answer to, to my prayers 
for me personally to understand, to fulfill that promise in the scripture, in multiple scriptures, that we will be able to recognize the signs um, surely, as, as surely as a fig tree, as surely as a woman in travail of labor. Uh, we can know that and we can, we can have that sense for ourselves. And that doesn't mean the day of, it doesn't mean the hour of. Um, I don't know that anything happens on the day of each of these eclipses, but I do know what they signify. For me personally, I know they represent oneness, the LF, uh, and protection for those who have received that seal um, in the TAV. But then without that, that, that sign that's made in April, that it signifies judgment, that it signifies separation. More than anything, I love to watch the Lord do his work, and I know he is doing his work uh, in preparation for his second coming. And um, I, I know that it's soon. And that, for me, uh, prompts me to want to be prepared spiritually more than anything, prepared temporally, and to help my brothers and sisters be prepared. Um, it is a time of joy. We're supposed to be looking forward with gladness to his coming, right? I know it's hard sometimes to, to see through the calamities, but President Nelson has promised that the future is glorious for those who are prepared. And I feel that all through my soul, I feel that too. I, I know that the, um, in the experiences that I've had and the, the witnesses that he's given me, I know that the good outweighs the bad. And that um, for those who are prepared spiritually, that this is a day to look forward to, the day that is ahead. And this is an important day right now, an important time to be prepared, to get prepared. It's a, it's a time of grace, really, and we really need to take advantage of it. It's a time to let go of the world completely, to love God more than anything and anyone else, and to serve him and to be, um, be in his temple. And I ended that, and then I had a strong prompting that, that yes, even though this is just a discussion, um, I need to end it in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.